Hi everyone and welcome back for the final session of Bioenergy 2030. As I indicated in the last, at the end of the last session, this is a big session and, uh, and it's been designed to really get across a couple of key, um, key messages and really to understand, I suppose, a little bit further what we need to now do in order to unlock the opportunity. Uh, so Gabby Sycamore, who is the General Manager of Renewable Gas for Gemini, is uh, is going to be managing this session. Um, and we're really grateful to Gabby for looking after this for us. Uh, Gabby sits on the board of Bioenergy Australia and, and certainly Gemini have been strong supporters of Bioenergy Australia um, since they became members and are incredibly active in the work that we do. So I will, at this point, hand over to Gabby for her to manage this session. Thanks so much, Gabby. Thank you, Shahana, and I'm really pleased to be with you all today, and I've really enjoyed the conversations that have been um, happening on the summit. Um, so we've got the exciting part of the agenda where we're really going to get into unlocking the 2030 targets outlined in the Bioenergy Roadmap, amongst other things. So to kick things off, I have the pleasure of introducing Pej Gitter, who's the Vice President and Global Leader of Future Energy for GHD. Um, he has over 23 years of experience in the environmental field and he's currently focused on energy transition and is um, a new energy and is GHD's global leader for future energy. Um, he's driving strategy globally in this space, engaging with stakeholders, expressing technical authority in what is a complex and changing landscape and helping his clients to understand where to make investments in this fast moving market. Today, Tej will be talking to us about bioenergy in Australia's circular economy. So over to you, Tej. All right, thank you very much, Gabby. I'm just going to um, get my uh, presentation up here. Give me two seconds, please. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen at this point. Could you just maybe, Gabby, confirm that you can see it? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. All right. Okay, yes, so thank you. Thank you for having me here uh, to talk about bioenergy. This is uh, um, an area that's very, very near and dear to my heart. Um, so just in, again, in, in, um, I don't obviously need to, to talk about myself anymore, I think. Thank you for that great introduction. Um, it is really great to be here today. So my job at GHD, is, as you noted, is to really work with clients around decarbonization around the world in many, many different aspects of the business. But bioenergy is really, really important uh, to me personally. I live in Canada. Um, I'm popularly known as a garbage person. I, I spent a lot of time around the garbage industry and just trying to find different ways to reconceptualize waste into something else. So I've been on that track for about 20 years now. Um, and, I, and in my opinion, bioenergy can form a really large part of the Australian landscape. So we're really proud to be contributors to bioenergy around the world. So obviously we've been working with Bioenergy Australia, but we're also members and have been for a long time of the Canadian Biogas Association and the World uh, Biogas Association. And before I go any further, I have to give uh, a little bit of an acknowledgement to Mark McGravitt and Alistair Green um, in our Australian business who have been across bioenergy and um, the work with Bioenergy Australia for quite a while. I've personally gotten to know and work across time zones with Alistair quite a bit. And it's always been an absolute pleasure in working on bioenergy projects in Australia. So I just wanted to spend a bit of time talking about um, the potential of bioenergy in the Australian context. And, and then get into a little bit of a pathway for what, what does a path look like for bioenergy in Australia and with a little bit of an overlay around mechanisms that I've seen to sponsor this type of economy in other types of the, in other parts of the world. And then I want to look at uh, renewable natural gas, as we call it, especially as it pertains to anaerobic digestion, which is a, a core expertise for me and, and something I've been involved with for a long time. Um, I've been working, for instance, with the city of Toronto, our biggest uh, city up here in Canada, 
um, on the development of their anaerobic digestion food waste systems for 12 years now. Um, all of that gas produced from that is going to renewable natural gas. And it's a really, really interesting deployment of what is the largest municipal organics collection system in North America, actually. And I'd be remiss if I didn't show it because um, I spent a lot of time around these plants, but these are two plants that the city of Toronto built specifically to take post-consumer residential food waste put out by the residents of the city of Toronto to these facilities to separate contaminants from organic material and put the organic material through the big digesters that you see there and produce lots of biogas and lots of biomethane. So two facilities fully built now and another two that are on the way that we're working on now. So quite proud of this uh, engagement. To me, it shows you what you can do in the bioenergy sector and, and what facilities look like in the space. So to me, again, I think bioenergy can really support Australia's energy transition. And this helps address greenhouse gas emissions and climate change, and it really improves the use of waste much of which previously had gone into the landfill environment. And just from personal experience, you know, this does bring jobs to regions and, and rural communities. Um, it has uh, crossed large and small population bases in other parts of the world. Um, it does decarbonize the gaseous fuels networks and potentially displaces the use of liquid fuels, um, such as diesel, if we shift to compressed natural gas uh, vehicles. The other thing it does, and that I've seen it do, is it addresses a really phenomenal desire for investment, looking at an environmental social governance lens to be placed into new kinds of projects. Um, in my experience over here in North America, we're actually at a point where there's more investment desire for this space than there are projects, which keeps us all very busy, but I think is a very positive indicator of just how powerful this industry can be from an investment standpoint. So it really is an untapped resource and it's also a circular economy resource. Taking food wastes that were destined for landfill and repurposing them into energy is fantastic. And, and I think we have to keep an eye on the fact that out of these anaerobic digesters, there's a fertilizer or a nutrient product that still is available and that can be put back on land to help with crops or um, fertilization for agriculture, which is a really nice secondary benefit to this entire process and the part that is really important to consider it as a benefit. So in terms of the sector, um, you know, haven't begun to realize bioenergy's potential in Australia. I think that's 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 probably true. Um, lots of things that can contribute in terms of, of money towards GDP per year, in terms of job creation, reducing emissions, especially um, slippage of methane emissions from the landfill environment, where it's very difficult to capture all landfill gas um, and diverting waste from landfill. Um, the potential is really large. Um, I would say over here, even in North America, where I sit, we've probably um, gotten to about, you know, 5% of all the bioenergy that we really need to deploy. So we're just starting here as well. Um, we're not as advanced in this space as say uh, Europe, where there's a lot of bioenergy and biomethane and a lot of anaerobic digestion, 20,000 anaerobic digesters last count in Europe, in Europe. So in terms of charting a path and, and what does it really look like? And what are some of the things that really incentivize an industry like this? So I think long-term stable government energy policy is really important. Um, sooner or later, that does need to manifest itself. I will say that I think it's very possible for early adopters uh, to start projects on the backs of business cases that are positive to really incentivize an industry like this. Um, mandated decarbonization of emission intensive industries, obviously very important. Cap and trade regulation, caps on large emitters that force large emitters to get involved in projects that allow them to economically drive down emissions reductions is really important. Financial support for technology development and development capital. To me, it's really about the development capital. There's not a lot of technology development that is really required in this sector. Um, bioenergy and especially in the gaseous fuels uh, networks and anaerobic digestion is quite proven and it's used around the world. So there's always optimization and improvement that's going on, but it's really about 
finding money and financial support into projects, especially in areas where you don't necessarily have a thriving offtake market for the final product. And then just having a culture of learning and education. One of my first steps when I got into this area was to spend a lot of time in Europe, which I quite enjoyed, just learning um, lessons from the Europeans about things that have really worked well and things that potentially hadn't worked well. And that was a great learning experience for us as we started developing a bioenergy industry here. So in working with Bioenergy Australia, um, we've come up or they've come up with a few recommendations to help the industry, which I think are quite powerful. So first off being clean futures targets. So this would include things like a clean fuels target, which is uh, something I'm quite familiar with over here. We call them low carbon fuel standards, um, a renewable heat target, um, a green gas target, and net zero organic to landfill without bioenergy recovery target. I think that last one, the net zero organic to landfill is a huge motivator in an industry like this. We've seen these so-called organic bans around the world. Uh, the great state of California with 40 million people has an organics ban. So you can't send organics to landfill anymore, which has rapidly promoted the development of a bioenergy industry because this material has to go somewhere. Um, the second uh, main pillar is a bioindustries fund for doing things like upgrading existing bioenergy facilities and helping with new project development, which I think is a, is a very sensible accelerator of the industry as a whole. Um, but I think some other things that Bioenergy Australia has been looking at really, really spoke to me. Um, I think we have to be quite frank about the fact that renewable natural gas generally is going to cost more per cubic meter than commodity fossil fuel derived natural gas. Not yet seen a situation where that's not true, although I will say the price disparity is coming closer and closer to parity over time as we get better at deploying technology and technology prices come down over time. But developing renewable gas injection tariffs with long-term horizons, sort of in that 15 to 20 year horizon, have really sponsored the industry here. We've seen natural gas distributors willing to offer long-term contracts at favorable pricing for renewable natural gas product because they are subject to some kind of emission regulation, such as cap and trade, that forces them to reduce. That has actually probably been the biggest progenitor of us really moving the industry here and moving it quite fast and, again, attracting all the investment into it. And then gas swapping. Um, gas swapping is really interesting here um, in North America. We are using renewable natural gas quite liberally with respect to virtually transacting it through the pipeline networks so that uh, a generation source in one jurisdiction can submit the gas to a completely other jurisdiction where it's actually commoditized and used by a large emitter. So these are really powerful instruments. There are many of them, and uh, I think it's very important to take a look at the confluence of what the best combination of these instruments are to really get a bioenergy um, industry moving. Um, again, I, you know, in my experience, the promotion of that kind of industry is a real, real positive for the economy. It's very positive from a job creation standpoint, and it drive down greenhouse gas emissions quite significantly as, um, as decarbonization continues. So thank you very much. I will turn it over to the next presenter. Yep, so that would be me. I'll just uh, share my screen if you give me one moment. Fantastic. Can everyone see my screen? If, uh, yes, we can. Perfect. Um, so yeah, I'm Michael from Energy Link Services. We've been uh, working on a report for the last about six months on strategies to bridge the, the price gap for sustainable aviation fuel with a focus on Australia. Um, so this, uh, this report that we've developed, you know, sustainable aviation fuel in Australia is currently anywhere from five to 10 times the price of traditional aviation fuels. So it's not really commercially viable for airlines to use it, particularly with everything that they've got on at the moment. And so we've looked at some strategies, um, done an international policy review, seen what best practice is, what key learnings can come out of international markets, uh, conducted some stakeholder consultations, uh, both domestically and internationally, just to see what logistical issues there are, what the general consensus is, um, around um, policy, uh, what people would like to see, what they wouldn't like to see, 
And then we've made a series of recommendations. There's four, uh, which I'll run through now. And that's, um, that's the basis of our report. So the first recommendation in terms of driving staff uptake in Australia and helping to bridge that price gap is around establishing a jet council. So this is mimicking what happened in the UK. Uh, we're bringing together all of the key stakeholders under one roof. We know Bioenergy Australia have working groups and they serve a fantastic purpose. They're just being able to get effectively real-time feedback with government bodies, be it federal, state governments, uh, government departments, such as Department of Defence, you know, SAF producers, traditional aviation fuel producers, to really inform any policy developments, give feedback on how things are going, uh, what the barriers are to implementation of projects and what sort of um, policies can help to overcome those barriers. And then also in the next recommendation, there's a voluntary purchasing program we're recommending and we think a JET Council would be very, very well placed to help bring parties into that and help on the administration side of that. Uh, and obviously the research and development pathways within Australia to help scale up the industry would benefit from a, a key central body with all the knowledge and relevant people involved. So the second recommendation is around a national framework for consumer purchasing. This is using a guarantee of origin scheme, uh, similar to the ones that exist or are currently being trialled by the CER for hydrogen. We also have renewable energy guarantees of origins, and I know there's talk about biomethane guarantees of origin schemes as well. And this really just allows traceability of who's buying SAF and, um, and what's getting blended into the, the fuel system. There are logistical challenges with tracing SAF through an airport. Um, you know, once it goes into the fuel hydrants, you, you can't trace the individual molecules. So if you're buying SAF, it's very hard to know if that actually went into your plane wing. Um, th there's no real way of doing that. And we see a guarantee of origin type scheme as a really nice way to navigate around that. And, uh, and allow people to make credible claims for buying SAF. And this then helps facilitate voluntary purchases, similar to what the Rocky Mountain Institute and the Environment Defence League have done in the UK through the Sustainable Aviation Fuels Buyers Alliance, uh, where you're delivering an equitable outcome by having customers who are willing and able to pay. And they're most likely your corporates that have got ambitious net zero emission targets or emission reduction targets, you know, your big consultancies, tech firms, those types of things, um, and they're willing to pay extra. So there's no additional burden that's falling to the general consumer. It's only those that are willing to pay. And we think that you can use this type of program to generate enough demand for SAF to get the first set of refineries constructed within Australia, which helps bring about industry maturity and then helps to kind of fall down that, that cost curve. Uh, and I just wanted to show in this table on the, um, on the right, the importance of actually driving down the price from the five to 10 range down towards twice the price. You know, we've, we've heard from stakeholders that there is significant demand for staff at twice the price of jet fuel. And you can see that the additional cost to the consumer is actually not that high um, relative to you know, the five times and the 10 times ranges that you see there. Um, we also think that this needs to be supplemented by government funding. Um, Obviously, Minister Taylor and Minister Bowen this morning were talking about various support programs that are either being looked at or are in the works. But we really see there being two options here for how you could provide financial support. The first is the traditional capital grants and low interest loans program. You know, there's existing bodies like ARENA and the CEFC that have been very successful uh, in maturing industries like large scale renewable energy industries um, through providing capital, low interest loans to help reduce that upfront funding requirement and improve the business case accordingly. And then we think the second option is more around a production-based subsidy. And so this is where you're kind of mimicking what's happened with the fuel security services payments to traditional fossil fuel refineries within Australia. Um, and you're looking at the, uh, the operating margins or the refining margins uh, and, and trying to kind of support the OPEX side of the business rather than the CAPEX side. And we think there's a, a real opportunity to use a reverse auction type approach where a refinery will bid in a price around a benchmark and that benchmark would probably be the traditional jet a1 price and the government will fund the difference between the benchmark and the and the jet a1 price uh, i guess one of the pros and cons of the difference between the two is in, with capital grants the government is picking winners per se um, you know they're deciding which technologies they want to invest in whereas using a production-based subsidy does give the market a bit more flexibility to decide what the most appropriate or the most cost-effective way um, to achieving low-cost SAF is 
and there's less of a, a government playing venture capitalist type scenario. So our final recommendation um, and something that's come up quite a lot in the discussion around biofuels um, and SAF is around the emissions intensity mandate. Uh, we do know there's obviously quite a bit of political tension around these types of programs, but nonetheless, we think it's the most effective way and the most cost effective way to actually reduce emissions in the aviation sector. Um, our focus has been purely on SAF. Uh, there are obviously similarities and extensions that could be drawn to other types of fuels, but that's beyond the scope of what we've looked at. But we see uh, Jet A1 being the benchmark intensity, so having effectively an emissions intensity of 100 and uh, looking to reduce that over time, you know, with an increasing percentage reduction required over time. Um, we've also chosen, and the program design should be based on the Californian model, where you are placing levies at the point of fuel sales. Uh, placing levies and, and obligations on individual airlines we see is a little bit problematic, and this was raised by quite a few stakeholders, um, just given there are a lot of international airlines with a very, very small footprint that don't actually play a huge fuel procurement role within Australia. Um, and so to exclude them would be disadvantageous to Australian airlines um, and it wouldn't really be fair. So if you place the, the liability at the point of fuel sale, then everyone is covered, be it an international airline, domestic airline, uh, and everyone's on a level playing field. And this, this approach also, and carrying on from the, the previous point around funding, it is a technology or SAF pathway agnostic approach. You're not dictating what technologies need to be used. You're just mandating a reduction in emissions intensity. And it's over to the market to come up with the most cost-effective solutions to do that. Um, and what, and the market will decide what the best mechanism is for that. So in terms of what an actual target might look like, we think that an initial target of around 2.5% in 2025 is a reasonable approach. That obviously gives the industry some time to make preparations for integrating SAF into the supply chain. And we acknowledge that not all of that's going to come from domestic production. There is going to be reliance on imports. And then the, the first kind of growth phase from 2025 to 2030, we see a, a very small scale up in uh, the required reduction. And the reason that we've done this is we think this is the, the, the period where there's going to be the highest cost staff. And um, we're, we're wary of burdening airlines too much by increasing those mandates to a higher level, but also giving refineries flexibility to access higher cost markets and higher revenue markets, such as California or the US or Europe, so that they really can get the best business case out of their refinery. And then the, the, the kind of consolidation phase between 2030 and 2040, it ramps up to a 10% mandate for uh, the required emissions intensity reductions with a final growth uh, phase from 2040 out to 2050, heading up towards 45%. Uh, we haven't modelled anything above 50%, just given that currently the ATSM standards don't allow for any blending above 50%. Um, but out to 2050, you know, we do expect there would be some technological developments and, um, and other things that we can't really forecast. So that those last 10 years, the target can really go wherever, wherever you would like to take it. Um, but there's a, there's a real opportunity to kind of leverage that growth um, to get large scale SAF uptake within Australia. And really the focus of this policy, while it does rely on imports initially, it is to get uh, refineries built within Australia. We think once you start the first set of refineries within Australia, building the next one becomes easier and easier. So in terms of financial impacts, there is obviously some cost uh, impost that comes with an intensity mandate. Uh, we've shown in this table to the right here. And again, it highlights the importance of driving the, the cost of SAF down and commercializing and scaling up the industry. But there is a significant price gap between um, Jet A1 procurement costs and blended SAF procurement costs. Um, and we think that if you can leverage all of the support programs we've mentioned previously, those voluntary consumer pass-throughs under a national you know, procurement framework and some government support, you really have a chance to try and get on the front of that cost curve, really drive costs down, and then the impact of that mandate is, is substantially lessened. And there are obviously benefits that come along with uh, SAF refinery. It's not all financial impost. You know, it creates jobs. It helps to protect regions which, you know, are at risk as traditional fossil fuels move or wind down. Um, and there are tax benefits and um, uh, that flow to governments who fund these types of programs and we do improve Australia's fuel security by being less reliant on imports. So we, we really do see that whilst there is some cost, 
uh, and that is obviously at the end of the day going to be borne by consumers. We do think that the benefits of that um, do outweigh do outweigh those costs that fall to to consumers. So that's um that's the the four recommendations that we've made. More than happy to um to answer any questions and feel free for anyone to reach out to me. Otherwise, um yeah, we'll look forward to participating in the panel shortly, and we'll um we'll hand over to our next speaker. Um, and our next speaker is uh, is Mark Jonker from Helmont Energy. He's got over 20 years experience in bioenergy and power projects, holding numerous positions across energy markets, including being responsible for the global growth and commercialization of new renewable energy technologies. He has extensive experience as a business and project developer and has project managed renewable and remote power projects in Australia, North America, the UK and Europe. In 2020, Mark was a founder of Helmont Energy and he continues to lead the company today, which is actively developing bioenergy projects which support the Australian agriculture industry and remote and regional communities. Mark is also leading Bioenergy Australia's working group that's focusing on incentives and certification for biomethane. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael, uh, for the intro. and. Uh, Thank you, Lauren, for stepping through my slides. Um, uh, very, very much appreciated. Um, so as Michael highlighted, I'm Managing Director of Helmont Energy, um, and we're focusing on the development and investment in biomethane projects in Australia. Um, we're choosing to, to develop our projects using agricultural um, feedstocks, largely because um, there's lots of them um, and they're underutilised and potentially uh, have um, you know provide a, a, an enormous opportunity to um, you know to displace fossil fuels um, in this country. Um, as Michael mentioned, we've been advocating for policy changes, uh, and you know we lead two working groups. Um, one being the Gas Injection Standard Working Group uh, for the Renewable Gas Alliance, and the other being um, the Incentives and Certification uh, Working Group. Um, suffice to say, uh, in the last two years, it's been a, it's been a bumpy road, um, but we're really pleased to see some green shoots emerge. And, and today, you know, you'll see some um, common themes between uh, those speakers who've come before and those that will come after in, in, in this presentation. So Lauren, I'll get you to move to the next slide, please. Uh, so the federal government's bioenergy roadmap identified that over 20% of Australia's total energy consumption has the potential to be derived from bioenergy. Um, the simple fact is that's huge. Um, and it shows that bioenergy can do the heavy lifting in hard to abate sectors such as transport, aviation and heating. Um, the key to this is creating commercial scale facilities um, that will reduce costs and will see bioenergy compete with conventional fossil derived energy sources. And as prior speakers have highlighted, um, the biomethane industry um, specifically um, within Europe and North America is mature. Um, that's not the case in Australia. Um, in fact, uh, we have one committed project under construction and this was supported with an ARENA grant and its offtake is vertically integrated with the project. Um, this model's not repeatable, it's not sustainable. And if we don't leverage the roadmap to create an appropriate policy setting, we're unlikely to see any more biomethane projects developed in this country. It is true that today bioenergy represents a relatively small proportion of the total energy mix. Um, however, 20 years ago, that wasn't the case. Um, bioenergy was the technology that did the heavy lifting and helped us transition into new technologies such as wind and solar. Um, companies like EDL and LMS um, were instrumental in helping kickstart the renewable electricity industry. Back then, the coalition's renewable energy target was the catalyst that helped underpin renewable electricity investment. Um, and bioenergy has the potential to do the same thing for natural gas as it did for electricity 20 years ago. Instead of bioelectricity, bioenergy can be converted into biomethane, um, in this case, biomethane can support the future technologies of hydrogen and renewable methane. We simply need to get the policy mechanisms right uh, to do this. Uh, next slide, Lauren. 
So the bioenergy roadmap sets some aspirational targets. Um, and without a target, we don't know where we're headed. And setting an aspir aspirational target is the right thing to do for our industry. But let's put this target into perspective. A biomethane target of 9% of domestic gas usage rep represents around about 50 petajoules per annum of natural gas displacement. Um, this equates to around 500 Malabar wastewater biomethane injection projects. And, and under the current policy setting, this is impossible and we will not deliver this target by 2030. Um, the roadmap sets out four themes to help us deliver the target. And this is a great initiative, um, but what is lacking from the published material is how we specifically um, translate those themes into the economic equations that are required to attract investment and commit off takers to purchase the product. Um, and what is clear from the federal government's position with regards to its policy statements is that it will be relying on funding technology to drive costs down and the voluntary market to lift supply and demand. And the question is, is this plausible and has it worked, worked in the past, bearing in mind the success of the renewable electricity industry um, and the backing of a mandated target that was set back in 1999. Um, presently, the industry relies on the increasing goodwill of our customers to pay the necessary premiums over fossil fuels to encourage this invest investment. Um, this will be done in anticipation that in the future, technology costs will fall, allowing clean energy companies to compete with fossil fuels. Um, this is what the current federal policies are designed to do. And whether it be the hydrogen guarantee of origin or the consumer emissions reporting transparency framework, these are the policies designed to give voluntary market participants the option to buy clean energy and report the use of that energy to the market, not because of financial incentives, but because of goodwill, um, or perhaps more specifically because of ESG mandates. Um, and there's no doubt that the ESG market is, is increasing in size and is driving investment in the in industry as Taj highlighted in his presentation. Um, with regards to the bio, bioenergy roadmap themes, we need to stare into a few issues um, and these need to be solved. Um, First, uh, first, if hard to abate sectors are going to use biomethane, those entities need to be able to report an emission reduction. Uh, without this, the industry is unable to offer the reportable benefits that come when purchasing biomethane. Um, secondly, if biomethane is to be complemented with other low emissions technologies, it must be incorporated into those policies that support those complementary low emissions technologies. Um, as an example, if biomethane is to be used to firm up the grid in gas-fired peaking generation, those gas generators should be able to participate in the renewable energy target or subsequent policy. What this does, it allows firming power from biomethane to compete with firming power from natural gas or batteries or hydro or, or other technologies. Um, thirdly, we know the bioenergy resource is large. Um, we at Helmont, we are focusing on agriculture because of the size of that sector. Um, and the bioenergy roadmap has verified this. Um, to access the resource, we will need to extend our existing policies that currently support a fraction of the bioenergy resource being landfill, animal effluent and wastewater. Um, specifically, that means the emissions reduction fund needs to be extended to a larger proportion of the resources that can produce bioenergy and abate carbon emissions. And we're really pleased to be working with DISA um, in, uh, in our efforts to you know, extend the RF method to, to other agricultural resources. So um, that's a great initiative that's been supported by the federal government. Um, lastly, and perhaps more importantly, we need to promote our market to our in international supply chain partners. We need their technology, we need investment, we need the traders and we need the, to leverage the expertise that has been gained overseas to meet these targets. This will only occur under the right policy setting. Next slide, Lauren. Uh, we've got a mountain to climb if we're, if we're going to build 500 Malabar projects over the next year, eight years. Um, we can do this, but we need resources allocated from the federal government to achieve this goal. There are specific 
policy instruments that could help us get there. Um, and I think the bioenergy roadmap has identified a few of them. Um, however, there's more work to do and we need to be crystal clear on what we want and why we want it. Um, in this slide, I've highlighted uh, those policies that have been mentioned in the roadmap with a green tick and the question mark represents additional policies that are existing or in development that could be um, used to support um, the biomethane industry in the creation of target uh, creation of a um, you know the an industry that will meet the target um, slide five all right uh, so for the roadmap, uh, sorry, for the road trip, we need a roadmap which provides a destination. Um, and on behalf of the industry, we, we thank ARENA and the federal government for providing this and, and like uh, through the bioenergy roadmap. Um, and like any road trip, we need to plan our journey. We need to set some stops along the way and the conditions that we want to travel. When it comes to biomethane, I'd like to see the industry and the government to focus its effort on a few key initiatives. Um, now it starts with the low emissions technology statement. Um, please can we make sure that bioenergy is not left out of the LEP this year. Um, it was left out last year, largely because of the pending release of the bioenergy roadmap. Um, the LEP is instrumental. It assigns funding to new policy, which helps remove barriers. Um, that is really important. So it is important that we see biomethane included in the LEP for 2022. Um, and let's make sure biomethane can be used by consumers to reduce their emissions. Um, there's a number of ways we can do this, but let's leverage the good work of Dyser and CER um, to ensure biomethane is included in programs like the Guarantee of Origin and CERT. Um, ultimately, Engers is where the rubber hits the road. Um, if biomethane were able to reduce a reporting entity scope one emissions, those entities um, would be incentivized to purchase the product. And that ultimately is what is needed to increase supply chain participation and liquidity. Um, funding is imperative. There are one-off barriers that need to be removed um, and it's not rocket science. It's been done overseas. So let's leverage the good work of our partners, um, some companies that are participating in, in, in Australia and a quick shout out to Johannes for his contribution today. I think the guys at the RNG Coalition are doing a great job. Um, perhaps as an aspiration, let's give some thought to a target. Um, let's face it, it does work. It's work in Europe. We heard Taj talk about it in, in North America. Um, uh, and it has worked here in Australia with the renewable energy industry, renewable, renewable electricity industry. The question is, why, why aren't we talking about this? Um, thank you for the opportunity to talk today. It is a privilege for me to present to you. Um, we're a small company. We're doing our bit to put Australia on the biomethane map. We need your support. We really appreciate the great work that Shahana and her team are doing at Bioenergy Australia. Uh, the next speaker is Andrew Parker from Qantas. Um, Andrew was appointed Qantas Chief Sustainability Officer in August 2021 to drive the group's sustainability and ESG strategy and commitments. Um, this includes the 2050 Net Zero Emissions Plan and one of his uh, one of the first of any airline worldwide. Um, so over to uh, to Andrew. Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. I will just um, bring up uh, my slides. If I can, uh, I can find them here. Of course, it's um, and I might ask Shana. I just um, sorry. Here it is. I'm just checking if you can see. Um... We can see that, yep. Great. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, thank you again. And thank you for this uh, opportunity to present uh, some perspectives from the Qantas Group uh, and our uh, bioenergy and sustainable aviation uh, plans get us to our net zero 2050 targets and our interim targets, which we will be announcing um, in the not too distant future. Um, if I could also uh, call out uh, from this morning, uh, the minister's comments and the shadow minister's comments, I think especially um, their support for SAF, they, they articulated this morning how difficult it is for aviation and airlines 
to abate our emissions as, as one of the hardest sectors uh, to manage our transition. And also, I think the fact that we should be uh, optimistic. I thought Michael made some great points in his presentation. South is emerging. We have done our first deal that you may have seen uh, with London Heathrow. Um, we have more to come. We're involving customers. Uh, and we think policy, as Tej said, is critical in this space of long-term stable government policy. So uh, we were encouraged by the comments, uh, particularly from the minister this morning. And it is not just the Commonwealth, but also the key role uh, of the states. Um, I'd first like to just very briefly touch on technology, which is aviation is complicated enough, but if you were to distill this slide really into one critical point, it is, there is a step change technology pathway for us to get to 2050, but it's only going to get us part of the way there. And if you um, can decipher uh, this table, it really demonstrates that the smaller, the more regional or the shorter range of flying that we do does have a variety of different technology solutions. But uh, the lower you go, the longer the sector, the more you see that SAF is really our only alternative. And this is the criticality, uh, therefore, of sustainable aviation fuel for us and for all airlines, but especially a country like Australia where we face very long distances. You'll also see that about 60% of our emissions come from our international flying as a group. And therefore, SAF is really the only technology um, that we can pursue as, as a true abatement. We are big, big believers in high quality offsetting and offsetting will be a part of our strategy um, all the way through to 2050, but we need SAF and we need domestic production. Um, as other speakers, including Michael mentioned, we do have a cost differential both to jet fuel, but also Australia compared to other jurisdictions um, in the world. And where those costs are coming down and the model that we will want to follow uh, in Australia is really three known buckets. And it is regulatory, both in terms of where we've seen in other jurisdictions, things like tax credits, particularly out of the US and Europe, which is focusing more uh, on mandates. It is supply. And this is where subsidies uh, by governments, by what the Biden administration has done in terms of research and development, but also direct um, financial uh, mechanisms to support capital investments um, are critical. It is the demand side. And this is something we're increasingly encouraged um, by through our conversations with Australian corporates, with multinationals who do want to invest with us in SAF as part of their scope three emissions and to get us to scale, um, particularly developing capability uh, in Australia. And it is also the consumer piece. Um, you might have also seen that we recently launched a green tier and we'll be are further releasing details on the elements of that program in the future. But at its heart, it's motivating consumers, um, not just through awareness, but how they can participate through current offsetting programs we have where Australia has some of the highest uptake in the world in terms of voluntary offsetting, but particularly how we then incorporate SAF uh, into consumer participation uh, to help us get to scale, to help us manage these costs and for consumers to, um, to manage uh, their own flying in terms of um, emissions. Very quickly, um, we've touched on a couple of the other jurisdictions and, and you know, this is, I think, both uh, the lesson for us, um, but also the wake up call, which is clearly the US and California, um, which has a range of initiatives that I think um, have enormous potential um, for Australia. It could be everything from um, the tax credit, from the grand uh, challenge that, that uh, the Biden administration announced to get to 3 billion gallons of SAF by 2030, by getting 
to 100% um, as, a, as a true drop in fuel versus the current uh, blending uh, restrictions. But it's also, if you look at California, for example, where they obviously have a carbon cap and trade program, the low carbon fuel standards, and a range of other initiatives um, to fundamentally alter um, the early economics of this program. And that we're also seeing in the UK and Europe in terms of their emission trading schemes um, mandates, um, as, as I mentioned earlier. But I think the incentive piece as well, where we are seeing SAF plant development right across the continent, Scandinavia uh, and the UK. Um, I would also uh, I would also call out um, just just finally um, you know the four areas that we think in Australia that uh, governments um, that governments do need to focus on and it is stimulating SAF demand. And we have seen, and the minister outlined this morning, some of the early investment uh, in the last 12 months, the $33 million that was announced. And we do think that's an important start, but clearly from all governments in Australia, it is how we further stimulate SAF demand and develop domestic production um, and how we de-risk some of these early investments. Clearly feedstock is key and we're spending a huge amount of time trying to understand the opportunities for Australian feedstocks and sourcing other potential feedstock um, globally and how we can provide financial assistance as a country to integrate that into the SAF supply chains um, given uh, the global race for quality feedstock is intensifying. And then it is the demand signal. I think it is um, production targets that um, we've heard about earlier today and it is mandating a SAF target um, like uh, the Department of Defence has, and also incorporating that into um, other government um, programs. So they were the key points um, I uh, wanted to make today on behalf of Qantas. Um, we are optimistic. We do see a pathway. We're encouraged on the demand side by corporate Australia and the international demand uh, from multinationals. Um, consumer interest um, is growing and clearly government is beginning to see the criticality of working with the industry on developing a true SAF pathway. Um, I'll now hand over to Melissa Pero. Melissa is the GM of Energy at Brickworks. She's got responsibility for energy and what is um, a company that has a big profile in terms of um, use of electricity and gas. Over to you, Melissa. Thank you, Andrew. Sorry, let me just share my screen here. Hopefully you can see that. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Andrew uh, mentioned, my name is Melissa Perro. I'm the General Manager of Energy at Brickwex, and I'm delighted to be here today to talk to you about how bioenergy is a de decarbonisation pathway for large gas users. Um, but first, let me just give you a bit of a background of our company, um, who is Brickworks and what are the products that we produce. Brickworks Limited is an ASX listed company and it consists of four business divisions. So there's a building products division in Australia. There's one in North America. We have a property uh, division and an investment division. We have a market capitalization of over $3 billion. And globally, we operate 39 manufacturing plants, including 12 brick plants here in Australia. Our Australian building product division retails under a number of brand, rate, brand names that you may recognize. And that includes Austral Bricks, which is our main brick brand. But Austral Bricks manufactures bricks that provide resilience and they hold a 100 year guarantee. Our bricks are made from clay. Uh, so our main product is actually a, a natural raw material. Our bricks are durable, fireproof, contain thermal mass for energy efficient design and have no indoor air emissions. And bricks are reusable and recyclable, so they fit really nicely with a circular economy. 
Austral Bricks has brick plants located across Australia in capital cities, and we manufacture over 500 million bricks each year. Now, to manufacture bricks, we operate our kilns at over a thousand degrees. And when bricks are fired, they slowly travel through the brick kiln uh, over a day. And this is a high heat process and it can't be electrified. In Australia, we consume more than three petajoules, which are three million gigajoules of natural gas each year. And natural gas combustion is the primary driver of our scope one emissions. So this represents a decarbonisation challenge for us because as a large gas consumer, we have few options currently available to help us decarbonise our brick operations. Now, I do just want to mention green hydrogen because there is a lot of excitement about the potential of green hydrogen to displace natural gas. Um, but one of the things is it's important to note that hydrogen isn't the same as natural gas and it does have a different gas specification. So at Brickworks, we're actually conducting research now on how hydrogen may impact our brick production process and that will allow us to be ready for a hydrogen future. However, um, as green hydrogen is currently three to four times the cost of natural gas, we do not see it as being commercially viable in the short term. But the good news is Brickworks actually has experience using uh, bioenergy and we use landfill gas at two of our Sydney plants. We were actually quite excited to learn about anaerobic digestion. Um, and we learned about the process of converting organic waste into biogas, which can then be upgraded to biomethane. And we were even more excited when we learned that unlike green hydrogen, renewable gas is commercially viable today. So it is somewhat comparable to um, our natural gas price. As biomethane is a renewable gas and it's similar to natural gas, it also has the advantage of meaning that we don't actually need to change our um, brick firing process. In October last year, Brickworks announced a collaboration with DeLorean Corporation to conduct a feasibility assessment to produce biomethane at facilities co-located with our brick plants in New South Wales. And this assessment is currently in process. As Brickworks is one of the largest gas consumers in the country, we buy our gas on a wholesale basis. And basically this means that we're essentially our own gas retailer. It does give us the flexibility that um, with the transition to uh, biomethane that we can also consider buying biomethane directly from facilities that are located somewhere near our brick plants. We see biomethane as a potential opportunity that could help us reduce the embodied emissions in our bricks. Renewable gas offers gas consumers a decarbonisation pathway. We encourage the government to continue to support the development of the renewable gas industry. And while the recent release of the ERF biomethane methodologies is a good start, it does appear that these very highly technical methodologies are quite narrow in scope and we think that they'll only cover some facilities. So we would like to see an expanded biomethane method that ensures all biomethane facilities are equally recognised. As has occurred in the renewable electricity market over the last 20 years, we believe there's a potential for the rapid development of distributed renewable gas facilities inside gas distribution networks. And we recognise the effort of many of the gas distributors, especially Gemina, who is our New South Wales gas distributor, where most of our gas load is located. Um, gas distributors have been really working through their strategies and identifying regulatory changes needed to decarbonise their gas networks. From a large gas user perspective, we see this work as being a priority as it's very difficult for us to fully decarbonise without the support of our gas distributors. It's also very important that we have independent verification processes developed, and that's really required to allow buyers of renewable gas to be able to make the carbon claims. We're pleased to see Green Power announce that they'll soon be um, commencing a renewable gas certification pilot. 
And finally, having recently joined Bioenergy Australia, Brickworks looks forward to working with others to help find ways to decarbonise our business. Um, and thank you for today, but let me pass this over now to Sam Don Donaldson, who is the Hub Sustainability Leader at Lane O'Rourke, and it's my pleasure to hand over to him now. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. And I did want to just acknowledge and first uh, thank Shahana McKenzie and Bioenergy Australia for the invite and opportunity to be part of this online summit and this panel session right now. Uh, so I work for, for Langer Rock, as Melissa just mentioned. Um, we're an international engineering and construction company. And for today, I did want to represent the construction sector as a whole um, and talk about the context and the challenges around bioenergy and opportunities of bioenergy in the construction industry. No slides uh, for everyone today, but happy to talk through um, the context of bioenergy in the construction sector. Um, so as a starting point, um, construction industry at a glance, I'd first start with some sobering facts. Um, the construction industry um, globally does represent about 29% of emissions. So there's a significant obligation for the entire community in the construction industry to abate emissions. Um, part of that percentage of global emissions is generated from a significant portion from the way in which we build projects. Um, so this is related to the delivery phase or construction phase of projects. Um, and it's to do with plant machinery and equipment that we utilize to help build projects. Roughly sits at about 7% of emissions globally um, comprised from those, those sources of emissions and activities. Um, so that's the area that I wanted to focus in on, on today's um, uh, talk and presentation and talk about how bioenergy can be a huge opportunity in that part of the construction sector. When we talk about um, that area of the construction industry, um, it has remained relatively unchanged for many years. Um, much of the construction plant machinery and equipment that we utilise now um, is powered by 100% standard diesel. We have seen emerging market opportunities um, come into the, to the marketplace around electric powered plant machinery and equipment and also green hydrogen start to emerge. Um, but we do see that this is a more emerging market opportunity and more of a longer term solution. And the reason is, is because of the technical requirements that's, that's really needed to be overcome to retrofit current plant machinery and equipment for those alternative green uh, fuel sources. Um, the additional capex expenditure for, for whole supply chain to be able to update their current fleet. Um, and also for current plant machinery and equipment, OEMs um, and also warranties only allows certain fuel sources to be utilised in that equipment. Um, so that's that reason um, and therefore um, a significant reason why we think that bioenergy is an important uh, clean energy mix not just in the short term, but also over the medium and long term. Um, just like we've heard in some of the uh, presentations earlier, there are some hard to abate sectors, such as the aviation industry and the construction industry is also considered to be quite a hard to abate um, industry. And I wanted to talk through some of the challenges that surrounds bioenergy at the moment. The first challenge is in relation to supply. So supply of traditional biofuel in the Australian marketplace is quite limited. Um, the only areas that we are able to um, collect um, biodiesel or traditional biodiesel is across the Eastern Front in Australia. Um, we are able to transport it to other places across Australia, but it doesn't actually provide the carbon savings if we were to do that. Um, the other uh, limitation is in relation to advanced biofuels. So, um, hydro-treated vegetable oil or re renewable diesel, as we call it. Um, it's very limited in the Australian marketplace and currently really not available for the construction industry. So to overcome um, those two challenges, we do really need to build up the scale um, of supply of both traditional biodiesel for the short term, but also advanced biofuels um, in the Australian marketplace. And we need to be able to serve all construction projects, those that are located not just only in the urban metropolitan areas, but also those that are in regional, remote and isolated areas across the, um, the landscape of Australia. The second challenge is in relation to cost. Um, so right now, um, cost is an issue. 
Um, and there are a number of um, factors, as we all know on this call, that um, does um, fluctuate the price point of both diesel and also um, biofuels. But currently right now, biofuels is, a, is, is at a higher cost than standard diesel. Um, so in terms of being able to direct the use or consumer behaviour to utilise biofuels, um, we really need to look at you know, policy design, um, incentivisation type schemes um, to really make it uh, a lower cost fuel um, or to direct um, the whole supply chain for using biofuels. The reason why this is such an important aspect for the construction industry is because it's quite renowned for having very tight margins. Um, and there's also um, uh, what we would say almost a race to the bottom type um, behavior when it comes to trying to win more work. So if the cost of biofuels is higher than standard diesel, um, or the cost of any sort of alternative green fuel is, is higher than standard diesel, it just won't be budgeted for, for many projects. And that's a good segue into the third sort of challenge that we have, and that's limitations in relation to policy design and contractual frameworks. But currently in the construction industry, there's, there's no real clear direction um, or policy commitment in the use of biofuels in the construction industry. We have seen some of our clients um, put in place uh, minimum requirements for the use of particular blends of biodiesel, traditional biodiesel, um, but we have to say on reflection that performance has been quite piecemeal and not at the uh, position that we would like to see in the construction industry. Um, so with this, um, we do think that policy, policy design should support the supply chain in making it easier for them to either purchase biofuels for their current fleet or either have that additional um, money or budget to be able to update their current fleet so it's compatible to using traditional and also um, advanced biofuels. We also know from our research that um, globally, all plant machinery and equipment can utilise lower blends of biodiesel, so traditional biodiesel mix of about B5. Globally, all plant machinery and equipment can utilise that. Um, and about 80% of plant machinery and equipment across the globe can utilise blends up to B20. So there's a real huge opportunity right now to be able to take traditional biodiesel in the construction industry if we set up the right levers and financial mechanisms in place. I think the fourth key challenge that I just wanted to mention was, was around consumer behaviour um, and misconceptions around biofuels. Um, there really is a lack of consumer or supply chain confidence in relation to the use of biofuels. And this is due to a number of negative perceptions that they have around these particular fuel types. We've even seen it when costs of certain alternative green fuels is at a cheaper rate than other fuels. So when we look at ethanol and, and E10 um, compared to unleaded petrol, um, a lot of the time it's, it's cheaper. However, still um, a lot of consumer behaviour points them to utilising unleaded petrol because there's negative perceptions around the performance of E10. That's very similar in, this, in, in the scenario of looking at biodiesel compared to standard diesel. Um, the fact is, and many on this call would appreciate that there is no um, impact on performance when looking at certain blends of biodiesel. Certainly it can come into technical considerations for, for um, tr traditional biodiesel mixes when you do go above B20 or beyond. Um, and renewable diesel is a fantastic opportunity in the construction industry because it's considered to be a drop-in product and can utilise it without avoiding any warranties. So I think there's a real call to action um, to look at advocacy, education, and even campaign-led activities um, to provide that awareness and understanding that biodiesel and other biofuel liquids um, really doesn't have any impact on performance. In terms of Laramorque's performance, um, it really does vary um, in the use of bioenergy. Um, and this is due to a, a number of variances in financial, environmental and legislative factors in the locations that we operate. Um, so in our UK arm of the business, um, Laramorque recently committed to uh, the use of hydro-treated vegetable oil or renewable diesel across all of our operations over in the UK. And we see that this will you know, provide significant carbon emission reductions of about 80% for our site operations. 
in Australia, it's a little bit uh, more limited compared to, to the UK, and this is due to the challenges that I just mentioned before. Um, at the moment, we've committed to a B5 biodiesel mix um, on construction projects uh, where the supply is readily available, so mostly across the eastern front. Coupled with this, we're also working with our supply chain partners and also um, many of our other partners um, who help provide uh, the services and products on our jobs to look at trialling higher blends in certain plant and equipment across our jobs in the eastern front. I think we, we're also starting to realise in the construction industry that we can't go at this alone. Um, so there's been a number of construction companies um, in the mix with Langer Orc that are trying to work out how we can send the right demand signals so that we can start to accelerate the supply of biodiesel um, and start to support the use of it in the construction industry. I think um, for, for some final notes here, um, I think there's some areas from a low carbon initiatives perspective that can be tackled um, specifically for the market segment. Um, then there's some other solutions or initiatives that are really specific for the industry. But I think this um, area around bioenergy is a cross industry led initiative. And I think it's great to have these events to hear about some of the challenges and issues and opportunities that are around in, in other industries outside of the construction industry. And I think we could you know, do a lot more to be able to share these learnings to support the acceleration of bioenergy and support the acceleration of the bioenergy roadmap. So that's a little bit around bioenergy, the challenge and the opportunity in the construction industry. And I'll now introduce and hand over to Mac Irvine, Director of Investment at Clean Energy Finance Corporation. Thanks, Sam. Uh, and thank you to Bioenergy Australia, in particular Shahara and her team for setting this up and all of the attendees. Great to meet you all virtually today. I'm just gonna try and share my screen quickly. Is that coming through for everyone? Yes, it is. Excellent. Um, so look, I've got a relatively short presentation today, but I think that I think most of the key topics have been covered. But I think what's in, like what's quite important to discuss is really the role that investors and financiers play in the market and the views that they take uh, for these sorts of projects. Ultimately, we're talking about creating an output, which is a, a SAF or industrial heat or renewable gas, for example and the ultimate decarbonisation potential. But in order to get there, we need to be investing capital, be that debt or equity into infrastructure or projects or, or other assets to enable that output and that outcome. And that's ultimately the role that the CFC plays in terms of investment, but also the broader industry development, for example, presenting at these sorts of events like today. So just a little bit about the CFC quickly for those who aren't aware. So in short, the, the CFC is the Australian Commonwealth Government owned Green Bank, um, established about 10 or 11 years ago. Uh, and effectively we look to invest across the whole of, green, of the green economy. So what does green economy mean? It's effectively looking at any type of investment, be that project level or fund level or company level that leads to some form of decarbonisation outcome as well as looking to attract uh, private sector capital into these sorts of investments where they otherwise may have not been interested or understood certain sectors. So to date, we have cumulative commitments of nine and a half billion dollars out of that 10, but we have exited certain either equity positions or refinanced some of that debt along the way. So today we've got about $7 billion of that 10 committed um, with about five of that deployed currently speaking. So obviously, you know, $3 billion or so of, uh, of, of money still in the kitty to invest. So we are very much project or investment constrained and not capital constrained. And we're effectively like an open-ended fund where we continue to invest and recycle that capital over time. There's a few kind of highlights there. So I won't step through all of those, but just to give you a bit of a flavor for um, the sort of role we've played. So I guess the lion's share of that is going into what we call powering renewable energy. Um, so that is primarily, I guess, the wind and solar sectors, given the size and scale of those sectors and the level of maturity relative to bioenergy, for example. Um, uh, but also noting that uh, from a leverage perspective, for every dollar that CFC has invested, we've got $2.40 um, uh, that's come from the private sector. So that's the key for uh, one of the key roles that we play in the market as well. In terms of the bioenergy and the waste and bioenergy sector in particular, so for context, that's the investment platform that I lead at the CFC. We've made investments of about $400 million of CFC capital 
uh, for a total investment value of about $1.7 billion. So as you'd appreciate, $400 million of CFC capital compared to a $10 billion fund is absolutely not the lion's share of, of investments. However, I think as we're all aware on the uh, on on the session today, it is a very nascent and, and a very um, you know very much an emerging sector or, or set of subsectors in the Australian marketplace. But we still have had some really good wins, both at project level and at kind of company level. Um, so we're talking about large scale energy from waste, anaerobic digestion, landfill gas, uh, process engineered fuel, and a couple of um, uh, a couple of corporate level investments for a whole range of activities on on, on the sort of energy side as well as the non-energy side, because there are non-energy outcomes that still lead to decarbonisation, which I'll talk to in just a moment. So the next slide here is what we call our kind of waste and bioenergy process flow. So as you can see, they're effectively to create the output that we ultimately want, which uh, yes, it does include electricity, um, but you know, Australia's love affair with energy really relates to electricity. But in, again, as most of us know on the call today, there are some other key outputs, which the bioenergy roadmap has identified, being renewable heat, biogas or biomethane or renewable gas, however you, however you define that, and biofuels as well. And then on the non-energy side, it could be recycled products. So for example, an anaerobic digestion facility will have um, you know, a digestate. So it's not an energy output, but still an important output for, uh, for decarbonisation, for utilising that you know, uh, high nutrient content for fertilisers or whatever it might be, as well as other recyclable materials like plastics, et cetera, which is not the focus of today's discussion, obviously, but just to give people a flavour for the sorts of feedstocks, technologies and outputs that the CFC looks to in, make investments into. And that's absolutely a non-exhaustive basis. So that is a much broader, uh, there is a much broader ecosystem out there, but just to kind of put a flavour around the sorts of things we look at and also recognising that gate fees is not necessarily an output. It's obviously an input into projects to create economics, but ultimately leading to what you can see on the far right of your screen there, which is, is really uh, looking for some sort of commercial outcome to, to attract investors in, into the space. Um, and then in terms of the way that investors will look uh, to make investments from a project level, so uh, I guess at a company level, that's relatively straightforward in terms of providing debt or equity to a specific company. But from a project perspective, this is where some of the challenge may lie from a structuring perspective. So um, starting from left and moving across to the right. So a typical project will have equity investors and debt providers or lenders or banks, however you define that, providing the total capital requirements for projects. The level of capital or the level of equity and debt in that balance is typically determined upon the ultimate risk profile of a project. So in theory, a riskier project is likely to have more equity and less debt. And there's a whole, a whole range of different risks associated with any project. That capital typically flows into a special purpose vehicle or an SPV or a project company, however you choose to define that. Um, and then it's a, a case of that project delivering, uh, sorry, that project company or SPV delivering the underlying project, which might be an anaerobic digestion facility, it might be a SAF project, whatever that piece of infrastructure or that asset might be, that's effectively the way that it's delivered through an SPB with the capital being raised in, into that vehicle. So there are, there are a few key contracts listed there. So obviously the, the construction contract or the EPC contract, so engineering, procurement, construction, and the operations and maintenance for the long term, uh, a couple of key contracts as well as uh, typical feedstock arrangements or waste supply agreements, whatever that feedstock might be. And then on the back end, it could be some form of electricity or, or PPA arrangement. It could be a gas uh, offtake, it could be a digestate um, offtake. There's a whole range of different offtakes on both the energy side, and the non-energy side, which either will have a cash flow, a positive cash flow or a, a revenue generated from that, or it might actually be that you have to pay to, to get rid of that material depending upon the type of project that you have. Um, so in terms of the revenue streams, I've, I've mentioned that briefly, but just to step through those. So feedstock revenues. So if the project is a waste or a gate fee derived project, so ultimately if a counterparty is typically sending their waste to a landfill, for example, or, or other end, end use and has to, have, has to pay for that, they're going to be incentivized to provide that material to a project if it, if it provides a lower cost or it might be a slightly higher cost, but they're incentivized for broader sustainability objectives that they might have in their business. Then there's the energy revenues. And again, like I said earlier, energy is much broader than electricity. So that could be gas, heat, or fuels. Again, not suggesting that electricity isn't a good outcome from a decarbonization perspective either, but I think in this space, at least my personal opinion is that solar, wind, batteries, and pumped hydro are gonna deal with most, if not all of the electricity challenges from a decarbonisation perspective, 
whereas bioenergy, as I'm sure we all know, is one of the kind of commercially viable opportunities or technologically viable opportunities to decarbonize other parts of the market. Um, and then you could have a byproduct revenue. So the example I gave earlier, anaerobic digestion provides a, a digestate byproduct, which is a high nutrient fertilizer effectively. So you may be able to sell that into the marketplace as well. Uh, and then there's obviously the costs associated with any project. So there we've got capital cost recovery, operating costs, maintenance costs, and other costs. So um, typical for any project. So I won't step through those in, in any more detail, but just to provide that. Um, at, at the highest level, I guess, though, what's important to note is that um, investors, whether that be equity or debt, are always interested in opportunities where they think they can make the appropriate risk-adjusted return. And so they're always looking for opportunities in the market the challenge to, I guess, the bioenergy sector, generally speaking, and, and, and a lot of this has been covered today already, so I, I won't spend you know too long on that, but we're ultimately talking about a relatively nascent and immature market, generally speaking, in Australia. We're talking about a lack of project development and project success to date. And so investors, are, when they're thinking about where they're deploying their capital, there's not as many reference facilities, at least locally, that they could look to. There are other constraints in the market, whether that be, you know, policy or regulation or appetites or, you know, lack of developers, et cetera. And so um, I guess what we would say to anyone in the market who's looking to develop a project or think about investment, it's ultimately looking to reduce the risk as much as possible to the investor, but still enabling them to, to, um, uh, to, to leave with a, a, an appropriate risk adjusted return. So... Um, as I say, the, the role of the CFC is not just to invest in projects, it is also more broadly around project development in terms of providing impartial guidance when people are thinking through how they how they do that. So again, we're not we're not an advisor and we're not a project developer, so don't get me wrong, but we're very happy to have early conversations with people when they're thinking about their own project development and structuring. Uh, we also are very well connected in the marketplace to be making introductions to people, whether that be on the advisory side, for example, legal advisors, uh, waste supply advisors, offtake advisors, whatever it might be, or, or other consultants in the marketplace. So please feel free to reach out at any stage to have a conversation uh, on your project. And we're very happy to provide, again, impartial advice based on what we've seen in the marketplace. Um, otherwise, that's the end of my presentation today and look forward to the, um, the Q&A panel uh, just to start shortly. shortly. Thank you, Mac. And a really great way to end as a reminder of the, the role clean energy finance can help us with um, progressing some of the developments that we're all no doubt thinking about. Um, I think you'd all agree today we've had a really impressive range of presentations and we've considered a lot of different insights, opportunities and challenges. Um, we've got about 10 minutes now for a further discussion. If you've got some burning questions, please do put them in the Q&A section. Um, to start off, I guess I really do want to acknowledge how much we have achieved in recent times, especially alongside some other high profile competing technologies and the fact that we're in a pretty noisy, complex energy transition debate um, and it's raging globally. So I, I do want to recognise that we have achieved so much, even though we're so focused on what more there is to do. Um, I think both the Energy Minister and the Shadow Energy Minister joining us this morning is a really good reflection on how much we are batting above our, um, our average in terms of being a, a, a smallish industry group that's got a lot of desire and potential to grow into something extremely significant. So I take heart from their participation this morning as well. Um, so let's dive a little bit deeper. And while I'm waiting for any questions to come through in the q and I, I might take the, the liberty of asking one myself. I feel, and I'm sure a lot of us do, a real sense of urgency to see bioenergy to continue to develop and achieve its potential. Um, the bioenergy roadmap itself identifies some consequences of the industry moving too slowly. And I think one of the risks to progress is, is around transparency of information, and that can be in terms of the feedstock availability, and it can also be on the progress of technology that has the potential to drive down costs of production. So I wouldn't mind just um, talking to the panel quickly to see if they've got views on what they're seeing to date around how can we help the industry overcome maybe some of the data transparency issues to help us really start to push on the size of the prize, particularly when it comes to feedstock. So um, given uh, Tej has been patiently waiting, I might ask him to, to join me and, and I'm happy for the panel if they all wanna turn their, their videos back on, but to, to start with his views on how the industry can perhaps overcome some of the data transparency issues with respect to, to feedstock. 
Yes. So, I mean, that is a great question. To me, this entire market, especially around the digestion piece, is all dictated by feedstock and offtake. And if you can have those two commercial ends of a project put together, I think the bit in between is, is rather simple to deal with. Um, I think if we're talking about the organic waste side of the world, um, I've yet to see a place where data is, is really good. I think it's always very difficult to get acceptable amounts of data to actually support this. To me, it's really about querying the people who own the waste. And I think that discussion is different depending on where you are. Up here where I sit, the municipalities own the waste and they have actually a reasonably good track record of, of, of ability to track the amount of waste they actually have in their possession. The private sources of waste, which is about two thirds of the equation, almost no data whatsoever. And it's, it's very difficult to, to sort out where you can make a business case based on the availability of feedstock. So I wish I could answer the question reliably, Gabby, but I have yet to see a really, really effective system for tracking waste in that way um, in the waste industry. Yeah, fair play. Did anyone else have anything further in terms of their views on how we might move the dial there? Hi, Gabby. Uh, Hi. I, I agree with that. I think, you know, we need, we need to track waste. Um, but in addition, I think we also need to get this message out. You know, we've got a, a great <clears throat> outcome from the Bioenergy Roadmap um, it's shared within this industry group and, and um, <clears throat> beneficiaries of this group. Um, I don't think it's widely known within you know, other sectors of the economy like the agricultural sector, just how much, um, how much they can contribute to the bioenergy resource. And, and I think the data we've got touches on what's available, but doesn't really go into whether it's economic to take that feedstock from what otherwise might have a beneficial use and do something different with it, like produce bioenergy from it. And I think the only way we're gonna get that data is if we engage um, with those industry groups um, within the ag sector and, um, and you know, through education and you know, through forums like this. And I guess I'll just add to that from an off-taker's perspective. Look, we use a lot, a lot of gas and um, we'll be using a lot of gas for the um, foreseeable future. And so it really, we're a manufacturer, we're not um, an expert in these technologies, but we'll really need to get our head around making sure that there is that organic waste stream available to produce just the amount of biomethane that um, you know we would like to use in our plants. So it's a really um, important area for us to try and understand. Yeah. I'll throw open to the, um, the uh, community. We've got a question here from Dennis Van Poveld from ENA. Um, he's asking, as bioenergy is a limited resource, it will most likely go to the sector with the highest value. How do you see this spread across the different sectors discussed today, such as SAF, biodiesel, electricity generation, or biomethane? Who wants to grab that one? Yeah, I'd like to um, a quick uh, bonus view, which is a couple of things. I think we are fortunate with SAF that we believe there's, there's probably about nine different technology pathways and, and uh, each has advantages and disadvantages, but that optionality um, is really important, um, both in terms of, I think, scale and price, uh, but also feedstock. Um, the other you know, fascinating thing is as a, as a hard to abate sector, it is going to be ensuring we get policy settings right so that the easier to abate sectors and, and you know, we will be frenemies um, with those who use biodiesel, for example, but because they have a transition pathway that's faster than ours, it's ensuring that we think about and map out those things in the short, medium and long term so that you can model feedstocks versus likely technology. Did anyone else want to respond to that one? I, I might have a go, Gabby. I think from my perspective, if I think about the renewable energy target, which let's be clear was an electricity target, not yeah. an energy target, um, when people were developing and probably still developing bioenergy projects, unfortunately, and I'm probably except for the maybe last six to 12 months, it's all about an electricity output because there was some form of of, of um, pricing there to support the economics. So we're obviously thinking now more about 
um, you know, the likes of Gemma and others who are, who are screaming out for this sort of green gas and thinking about innovative ways to make that more economic. So the market is moving in the right direction, but with some sort of really strong uh, policy or other signal, again, I don't know the answer to what that's going to look like, but it's dependent upon what the, the drivers are in the marketplace. So as I said, the, the clear example, which is an existing one, is the REC, which drove people to do certain things in our space, as well as solar, wind and otherwise. But whatever sort of policy mechanism or other mechanism is going to drive people towards the most economic outcome for them to deliver the best returns on their investment, I think that's where it's going to go to. Yeah. Michael. Yeah, I was going to say, if I jump in as well, I think um, the market's going to dictate what the highest value proposition is. Like there's not going to be project developers who want to sell a high value product to the lowest cost. They're going to want the highest value that they can get. So even though bioenergy is a limited resource, in the strictest sense, there are technologies that are coming on and it will just spur further technology development. So, you know, for say renewable electricity, to use that example where bioenergy is favoured that there are more higher value products that can be produced. There are other technologies that will step in to fill that void. And yeah, I think great. that will go for biomethane and, and SAF and the like as well. And with the last um, two minutes that we have left, I, I, I sort of um, listened to what the energy minister and, and Chris Bowen had to say this morning, but I, I guess I didn't feel a huge sense that he was ne necessarily signaling that he's gonna be adding biomethane to his low emissions technology statement. So what do we need to do to thump the table a little bit harder? Do we need to be bolder? Do we need to um, be firing up our regional centers? Does anyone have any sort of views on how we can um, start shouting a little bit louder? Because I think we've presented today so many good meaningful insights. You sit here going, it'd be crazy. Why are they not taking further action to really help push this market in the right direction? Yeah, how do we get a little bit louder, a bit noisier? Just from a renewable gas perspective, I think it's really important when we're, states are, are undergoing reviews and looking at how they can decarbonise the gas networks, that we really make sure that the focus isn't just on hydrogen, that the focus is on all available technologies and all of the renewable gases that are available, because I really don't think there'll be one solution, that we need that mix and we need to make sure that any new schemes that come in include all of the available technologies yeah yeah i think as well um you know we've heard a lot today from kind of the production side but once you start getting the big corporate demand and the industry if you have a united front you know the likes of melissa going forward and being like no we actually want this there's merit to this and it kind of then is a push and pull rather than just trying to get something happening i think at the end of the day minister is going to do things that um, they see benefiting industry and that they're not going to get a lot of pushback across the spectrum from. They don't want to necessarily have those fights. So if you bring industry, you know, from production and end use side, you can kind of eliminate or smooth out that, that pathway to doing something. Yeah, because I look at all of you here today and I go, all of the major industries are represented. So, you know, what more does it take, Sam? I was just going to say this, um, touching on to Michael's comments, uh, I completely agree. I think there needs to be a more cross industry led collaborative sort of framework. And I think we've seen some pretty good models of this. Um, one of which set up by uh, World um, uh, WWF Australia in terms of ma the materials embodied carbon leaders alliance, where they're looking at both supply and demand end users to try and work out solutions to reduce um, the carbon intensity of materials that we use on building projects. I think the same could be set up in terms of um, bio-liquid fuels and biogas as well. There could be a cross industry-led initiative type framework where we're working with suppliers and we're also working with end users to drive up the demand and also help drive up the supply. All right, thank you. Well, I might pause it there and Shahana, are you waiting in the wings? We're right on time. Uh, I am here, well done, great session. Um, and I agree with all of those comments that were that were just made. And I think that, yes, there is an element and a role to the federal government engagement, but completely agree that in the absence of federal government policies, you know, for us to be pushing really hard at the state level and very much looking forward to all sectors of the supply chain um, into the future in order for us to really progress, particularly 
the focus areas that have come out of the bioenergy roadmap as, as key opportunities. So thank you so much everyone for, for that session. It was, um, it was a fantastic session. Thank you for all of our speakers today that have participated and our sponsors. Uh, I think it's been, whilst in, it's been disappointing that we couldn't be face to face, um, I still think we've, you know, this is a step in the right direction in terms of pushing things forward. And as was said earlier today, three months out from a federal election, who knows what the uh, climate policy land could be looking like in three months from now. So thank you everyone. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you.